and this is, this is a matter of public record in the government's own research into what has been going on, and in which certain persons have been killed, and their killing has been approved by the courts, who were merely depressed because their lives had gone wrong. You will discover a regime <laughs> within which the tables have been turned and to give you one example, a friend, colleague of mine, friend of mine who is an expert on this situation was interviewing one of the best known Dutch euthanasia doctors and said to him, what do you do if an elderly person comes to you and asks to have euthanasia and it's obvious to you they are under pressure from their children to do this and they don't really want to at all. Now remember, Holland is the high point of autonomy argument for euthanasia. Autonomy, autonomy, autonomy is the case. The doctor replied to my friend, it's a complicated world, I would do it. And here you see autonomy turned precisely on its head. And you see the distinction between so-called voluntary euthanasia and the involuntary euthanasia privatized by the state killing of the Nazis, in effect, elderly people being forced to volunteer for euthanasia. And that's how it'll go. Let me go, can I, can uh, I, sorry, can I just, can I, I, I know you want to respond, Dr. Singer. In fact, this will be the final response before we go to the questions from the audience, so I just wanted to alert you to that fact. Uh, certainly we're getting a picture from Dr. Cameron that Holland is really a failure in terms of human dignity and the people are being killed unnecessarily, and you might want to address that as well, if you would. If I could. Um, I, th I think that's a, a completely false and misleading picture of what's happening in the Netherlands. And let me just ask you this question before I go into the details. If that were an accurate picture, why would it be that um, after many years of the open practice of voluntary euthanasia, the Dutch parliament, the democratically elected parliament in a society with a very free press, approved the full legalization of this by uh, very strong majorities, essentially uh, close to two to one majorities, and that this, the next country in the world to legalize voluntary euthanasia should be the Netherlands' neighbour, Belgium, and the only other country where a majority of the ha inhabitants speak what is effectively the same language as the Netherlands and can read the Dutch newspapers. In other words, of all the countries in the world, the one you would expect to be best informed on the state of practice of voluntary euthanasia in, ne in the Netherlands is Belgium. And that has been the next country to follow that example. And again, by a strong margin, just in the last, uh, in the last week or two, uh, the, up, the um, upper house completed the legalization of voluntary euthanasia on similar lines in the, in the Netherlands. Why is this? The reason why it is is because, in fact, the citizens of these countries believe that this is giving them the choice that they want to have when they come near the end of their lives. They've seen it in practice. They've known people, relatives or friends, who've used it, and they want it for themselves. In terms of the statistics that uh, Dr. Cameron uh, mentioned, it's true that the government conducted surveys into uh, the, the number of cases of non-voluntary euthanasia carried out in the Netherlands, and it's true that it found a certain number of cases. Did it find that there were more such cases than in any other country? No, it did not. It did not because there has not been comparable research in any other country, including this country. Together with some colleagues, I attempted to carry out comparable research in Australia. It wasn't easy to do because doctors had to be more secretive about what they were doing, but the not totally conclusive research we carried out suggested that there was more non-voluntary euthanasia going on in Australia than there is in the Netherlands, although voluntary euthanasia is not legal in Australia. The same would be true of, of, of this country. Now, in fact, um, when uh, Dr Cameron talks of thousands of cases of non-voluntary euthanasia, most of those cases are cases that do happen here. They are cases of doctors who are withdrawing life support knowing that that will end the patient's life and giving doses of morphine where the patient is in pain knowing that that will shorten the patient's life. Those are things, in fact, specifically the last one, that Dr Cameron himself supports and yet he is including those in the statistics. Or if he's not including them, then the answer is that they are not thousands of such cases. There are perhaps in the whole of the Netherlands about 1,000 each year, and those cases are overwhelmingly patients whom the doctors believe had less than 24 hours to live and who were no longer competent to um, make requests about their future. So I don't think that there is, in fact, any sign 
of a slippery slope in the Netherlands or a situation that is in any way worse from the point of view of people being put to death against their will than um, is the case in the United States. And each of you will have six minutes at the end to conclude remarks. And uh, Peter Singer, you'll go first in those concluding remarks since Nigel Cameron went first in the opening remarks. I'm going to go to the questions in the audience now. And uh, I'm looking at one here. It says, is there any reasonable middle ground? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, are we both supposed to ask these? Answer these? No, or? actually, this uh, it says to both or to either. Um, so why don't you both have a go at it? you want to begin, Peter Singer? Well, I think that, I mean, it's a good question, really, because in some ways um, I think that there is less middle ground than many people think. And um, I think Dr. Cameron, uh, from the radio discussion we had on your program, will agree with that. For example, I think that there is a real problem with a current middle ground position which says... Uh, every woman should be able to terminate a pregnancy whenever she wants to, but as soon as a baby is born, its life is sacrosanct and to be protected in the same way as, as Dr. Cameron's or mine is to be protected. I think that's a difficult middle ground because I don't think that the mere fact that the baby has been delivered makes such a huge difference. If you're allowed to kill a baby in the womb, if you're allowed to kill a baby in the womb because you know that it has um, a disability, that it has, let's say, spina bifida or whatever, a common reason why babies are killed in the womb, then there's a really difficult thing to say that as soon as the baby is born, if you didn't know that it had this condition in the womb, but you would have killed it if it had, now you can no longer kill it. So there is a kind of a middle ground there, and perhaps I'm making some of the people who might have otherwise supported me feel a bit uncomfortable, but I think you do need to think about, about this situation. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm really here not to sort of win votes, but to kind of clarify the issues because I think that's what a philosopher is supposed to do, to help you to think critically about the issues. And if I've, you know, helped you to think critically about them, then that's, that's a good thing to do. On the question of, uh, not of abortion and, and infanticide and, and so on, but on the question of voluntary euthanasia, um, I suppose there are middle ground positions, um, though I'm not terribly comfortable with them philosophically, but I guess there are ways of saying, well, look, let's just let doctors give huge amounts of pain relief and let's say that that's not voluntary euthanasia but in fact we'll know that they're making patients comfortable when the patients want to as long as the patients ask for it. There's a kind of pragmatic compromise there but uh, as I've tried to say not one that I think really is philosophically on very strong grounds. Nigel Cameron? Well, I, you know, th this is the point at which I think Peter and I <laughs> agree. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I was, I was, I was, there were, were, of course, great outrageous protests when he was appointed at Princeton. And I said to my friends, well, I'm in two minds about this because um, through my knowledge of Peter, Peter Singer, um, he wonderfully clarifies debates. And he is a modest and genial man whom I respect and like personally. Um, he believes quite appalling things, which I find, I find, impossible in some ways to put into you know polite language my response to some of his views because I think they are absolutely appalling but he has the great merit of honesty and candor in the way he expresses his position and for every Peter Singer in the bioethics world you will find a hundred others who will stand here and who will fudge and I think it is uh, very important for us and that is why I think to call this the debate of the century is perhaps not entirely immodest. Of course, neither Peter nor I is a native-born American, so we are unable to comment on the, the use of uh, extravagant language in this context. Uh, <laughs> but it does seem to me, it does seem to me that in clarifying this question of whether to be human is what is absolutely, crucially, centrally significant, or whether it's to be human and to be able to do stuff, to be able to have competences, or maybe not to be human and to be able to do stuff and have competences. Between those two positions, there is absolutely no middle ground. And those of us who believe in the radical indivisibility of human dignity, I think, find ourselves welcoming the clarity which comes um, from an interlocutor who takes the view that in being human in itself, there is nothing special. It's all a matter of what competences you have, what morally relevant characteristics you have to use one of Peter Singer's terms, and who will write a book with a colleague with the title, Should the Baby Live? And answer no. Well, sometimes I think is the answer. Peter Singer, uh, I think uh, I'm certainly, I don't think I am in agreement with Nigel Cameron in characterizing you as an amiable man and <laughs> a modest man. 
Um, but you, ha you do certainly evoke a lot of hostility and anger and enmity, uh, as we've witnessed here this evening, and some of it is reflected in some of these questions. So I'm just going to give you a little pastiche here, and maybe you can deal with them accordingly. Um, if all life is equally valuable and therefore equally worth saving, how should limited... Well, wait, no, let me, let me go to something else here. Um, no, I, wanted, I wanted to get to some of the things that I think have a, a, a kind of central motif with them. I was misdiagnosed as vegetative state when I had my brain injury. Would your view of human life have saved me or not? I am now 10 years post-injury, walking, talking, and thinking. This comes from someone in the audience who says, Dr. Singer, how have you acquired the knowledge on what adults with severe disabilities need to live happy lives? And this comes from a gentleman who said, I, was, I have had cerebral palsy since birth. Can you look me in the face and tell me you think I should be dead? This seems to me to be a pattern. Uh, I mean, if I can, they're all individual and they're all very distinctly individual, but they seem to represent a kind of collective voice that you have certainly heard before. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, let me just answer the last of those questions. The gentleman, or maybe it was a woman, I don't know, with cerebral palsy, uh, who asked, can I look him or her in the face and say, uh, you should not be alive? Certainly not. Um, I'm not going to say that to anyone who is um, wanting to go on living. I will support your, your right to life as long as you want to go on living. And I will also, as I said, support the idea that we should not stint on the assistance that the state gives you to integrate as fully as possible into the, uh, into the wider community. But if there comes a point where you say that you find your life is no longer worth living, then I would also support you in, you know, if that's a, a persistent view that you hold, not just uh, on a whim, not just you get up, as, as Nigel Cameron said, on a, a more, one, one morning with a, with a, a bad feeling and, and want to go on, don't want to go on living. But if over time you persistently take that view and request it, then I would also support your right to end it. Um, if we ask, you know, how does one decide that? Well, as I've said, I don't want to make that decision, but I do think that well-informed well parents are the best ones to make it. And, uh, you know, you might say, well, if your parents had had that information, they would not have kept you alive. Um, they would have ended your life. That's perfectly possible. I have to say, there no doubt are people here in the audience whose parents, given this option, might not have kept them alive. Now, there are, other people in this, there are other people who are not in this audience who might then be alive. Um, for example, it's, it's quite possible many, many couples have a sense of how many children they want to have. If their newborn infant with a disability had died uh, in a week or a month after birth, perhaps they would have gone on to have another child um, who would now be alive and living, let's say, at least equally as good a life as those of you who are in this audience who feel that your lives were in jeopardy. So I don't... I don't myself think, you know, focus only on the tragedy of saying that one of you here in this audience who are having a good life might not have lived if my views had been put into effect. As I say, there may be someone else who is not alive now because you, all, you continue to live. And that, that may be true for any of us, of course, um, no matter what conditions that we had. Uh, what about the, the possibility of misdiagnosis? I think I did deal with that in an earlier uh, question of yours, Michael. Um, it's true that uh, there can be misdiagnosis. It's true that we, we want to be as clear as we can about this. And I think, for example, with persistent vegetative state, um, we, should only, we should only end life where we have excluded every possible uncertainty. And fortunately, nowadays, we have capacities to produce images of the brain that at least in some cases, I believe, can exclude such uncertainty. That is, if we can see that the cortex no longer exists, that the part of the brain associated with consciousness has simply turned to fluid, and that is the case of some patients in persistent vegetative state, then we can know that they can never recover. And I think in those cases we can feel that we can end life. We could treat them as we now treat people who are brain dead, which incidentally I think is another of these convenient fictions the label brain dead is a convenient fiction for not having to sustain people and being able to remove the organs of people who we accept have no continued life that is of any value. But, you know, I think biologically they're alive, they're still warm, their hearts are beating, their blood is circulating, their hair is growing. If they're pregnant, they can gestate babies for months, as actually happened in one case here in Oakland um, a while ago. So I think that's, that's, another, that's another fiction. But... Um, uh, certainly we, must, we should do what we can to avoid these misdiagnoses, misdiagnoses, but I don't claim that we can ever be 100% certain because of the nature of the fallibility that we're dealing with. 
There are a plethora of questions here. We'll get to as many as we can. One way to do this, I think, is to bundle them together in terms of, like I said, there's a good deal of that kind of hostility about uh, would Peter Singer's uh, thesis here apply to people individually who are in the audience and so forth, and I think he's uh, tried to address that. And I'd like uh, Nigel Cameron to address some of uh, what I sense is coming from the audience in opposition to you. Would you agree that uh, Aristotle, for example, and other great thinkers who say that human beings are more noble than other animals, and based upon the evolutionary relationship between humans and chimpanzees, along with recent work done by Jane Goodall and others, which shows differences between humans and chimpanzees is quantitative, not qualitative, how can you make the ethical distinction between humans and chimpanzees? Now, I think these are questions along a similar line. In other words, are you putting humans again into a special category, especially when we're about, well, we're pretty close to orangutans and chimpanzees, obviously. Where does one begin? Um, it, 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 it seems to me that the question here is not whether chimpanzees, uh, let us say, uh, can display intelligence and emotion and many of the, of the, the, the quasi-human sort of features which, which they do and which plainly, you know, we use the term ape. I mean, they ape us. I mean, they're, they're very like us in lots of ways. Uh, one does not need to dispute that, or indeed, one might well want to take the view that they therefore should be protected from ill treatment of various kinds. And of course, one of the central traditions of our humane culture has been, you know, regulation and law to protect animals from ill treatment. Um, and to control experimentation and so on. That's a huge issue. But it seems to me that we may well want to protect animals from all kinds of ill treatment, and certainly the, the higher apes. Um, it is a different question, however, from the species question. And I'll make a brief comment on that, because that does seem to me to be the, what lies at the heart of, of, of Peter Singer's critique of the Judeo-Christian tradition, in which humankind is singled out as being uniquely special. Um, and that is that if you take the view, I mean, you really only have two views you can take here. At the end of the day, either you take the view that human nature in and of itself is distinct, and that then controls every discussion you have, whether about medical futility, whether about the sanctity of life, uh, whether about uh, how we treat the weak and the powerless. I mean, this whole range of questions flows from a vision of human dignity. Or you take the view that there is some kind of amalgam of qualities within human beings and potentially other beings which make certain kinds of beings special and deserving of certain kind of treatment, ultimately in our society of being able to vote and have social security numbers, having a certain status as mature creatures within the community. And Professor Singer's approach, I don't want to put words in his mouth he won't own here, uh, if he weren't here, I might be happy to do that, but he is here. Uh, but it seems to me his approach, uh, and he uses this category of what he calls morally relevant characteristics, is to list six or seven uh, competencies. Um, consciousness, rationality, capacity to communicate, things of that kind, which distinguish a particular individual from other individuals. Now, and he says if you take the view A, you are a speciesist. You take view B, you are responding to the moral claims of, of persons or potential persons who actually do display some of these qualities. And at one level, there is much appeal in his approach, until you realize what he is doing. Because, you see, what he is doing is, in fact, and since he uses the ist term, I think we're free to turn it back on him, what, in fact, he is doing is precisely what, for example, the racist does. The racist, you see, says, well, we have here homo sapiens, we have the human community, and we will say that certain persons within this community, because of pigmentation, ethnicity, descent, whatever the criterion is, have special character, and we will give them special dignity as over against the others. Now, what he is doing is saying, here we have homo sapiens, the human community, and certain members of this community, because of their competences, because of what they can do, ultimately will be singled out for special attention over against the other members of the human community. So it seems to me that the speciesist um, boot is on the other foot. Well, as you might imagine, Peter Singer, you're, uh, there, there, there are many more questions for you. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of which would really best represent many people in the audience. This one, it seems to me, is one of those. The term suffering is repeatedly applied to people with disabilities by 
uh, Peter Singer. What is his definition of suffering, and how do you know people with disabilities suffer because of their disability? Is suffering a cause for murder? Well, obviously not everybody with a disability is suffering. I've, I've never made any such claim. Um, and lots of people without disabilities suffer in, in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, suffering is a very broad term. It refers to uh, a condition that someone um, has a strong aversion to, strongly dislikes being in that state. I think that's um, probably about as, as specific as I want to get, but um, we all know that it, it has degrees and there's various things that, uh, different types of suffering, mental, physical, and, and so on. Um, how do we know that someone is in that state? Well, I think we, uh, sometimes we can observe it, particularly with the, the, the physical kind, we can observe it. I think you know, we know when animals are suffering. Um, Nigel Cameron talked about his uh, elderly dog and how you might get into a state. I think anyone who's had a dog or a cat might know when there's a time when they make the judgment that that dog or cat's uh, now ill and is suffering and is not likely to recover. And, um, you know, that's just then becomes pointless suffering. Uh, and I think one can make the same sorts of judgments, for example, with severely disabled infants in, in certain conditions. And I think, you know, physicians who've looked at, at some conditions, not all of them, obviously, of some certain kinds of disabilities that are uh, involved with fairly extreme suffering um, and, and others that are not. And equally, at the, at the end of life, um, of course, generally, conscious beings can tell you, um, sorry, self-aware beings who can use language, can communicate, can tell you that they're suffering. So those are ways that we can know too. But um, obviously if you're talking about infants with disabilities who are not actually suffering right there and then, you're making a judgment, you're making a prediction about what their life will be like. And I don't pretend that that's an easy thing to do. Um, it's a difficult uh, decision to make because the conditions you know, may be varied. Um, they may be cases where there is um, psychological, likely to be psychological suffering, and people will adapt in different ways to those conditions. So I think it's, it's actually difficult to make those judgments, but as I said, I think we do make those judgments either way. We make those judgments when we keep uh, infants alive, when we apply all the powers of modern medical technology to prolonging life, when we ensure that infants who 50 years ago would certainly have died within a week of birth do now live and do now have a uh, a, li a life of uh, 10 or 20 or, or longer years. So that's a decision that we make, and that's therefore based on a judgment, I think, that this life is one that is worth preserving. Uh, yep. Conversely, the opposite decision is made on a, on a different judgment. Excuse me, I just want to follow up with something, because apropos of the difficulty of making those decisions, and just apropos also of what was said about speciesism, this is a question also for you, Peter Singer. How do you rationalize your contrary views of animal rights and infanticide? The requirements that justify existence, autonomy, self-awareness, and rationality are not satisfied by most animals. Well, indeed, um, but there's, there's, there's no inconsistency. I think that exactly the same standards ought to be applied. My, for those of you who um, are familiar with the fact that I'm the author of a book called Animal Liberation, but have not read it, and you might know that that book uh, argues that we ought to be vegetarians, you might imagine that this argument is made on the basis of the idea that animals have a right to life. But if that is what you think, you ought to go and read the book because that is nowhere argued in the book. Um, the book is essentially an argument that um, animals are sentient beings, as I said right at the beginning in my opening statement, they are beings who have the capacity to feel pain, that their pain matters, that we're not justified in ignoring or discounting the significance of pain because the being that feels pain is not a member of our species. And then the book uh, points out in some detail in a couple of long chapters that, uh, that we inflict a great deal of pain on animals for, uh, for example, um, for, by raising them for food. That this is not a painless process, that uh, this is not a situation in which animals live their normal lives and then suddenly are instantly killed, but it's one in which essentially from the moment of birth um, through to death, they are simply items of commerce in a vast system of application of modern technology to producing animal products as cheaply as agribusiness can possibly produce them. And that the suffering of those animals in that system counts for nothing as long as it doesn't interfere with the profitability of the system. So that's what the argument is based on. It's based on the idea that we are ignoring the pains and sufferings of sentient beings, not on the idea that they have a right to life. And it's exactly on that, in that way that I defend 
um, infanticide or euthanasia for infants in some circumstances, where I think um, that is also what is in their interests as sentient beings, given the suffering that they um, are likely to experience if they continue to live. So um, I don't hold that uh, animals have rights to life that humans of equivalent capacities do not have. Um, it's only where we have the higher capacities that Nigel Cameron mentioned that I think there is a full claim, full-fledged right to life. And I think that's something that most, but obviously not all, human beings possess, and that some, but again obviously not all, non-humans possess. Certainly I think the, the great apes that we mentioned before, the chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans and gorillas possess it. But how far down it goes, um, I'm not sure. That's a much more difficult question. So I'm not making a, the, the claims I make for animals in terms of anything that's not exactly, uh, should I say, on all fours with the claims that I make for humans. Nigel Cameron, if all life is equally valuable and therefore equally worth saving, how should limited resources, medical resources, be fairly distributed? I think we've broached this to a degree, but you're, what, what do you how, say? How many, how many hours do we have? Um, it seems to me that, that that is an extraordinarily difficult issue. Uh, it's a particularly difficult issue in the context of um, state healthcare systems. Of course, uh, in the context of private healthcare system, these decisions are made without a central reflection on how you allocate resources. I think, of course, in the context of systems in which you know, you have a pot of money and you decide what we're going to give to immunizing children and what we're going to give to taking care of people with, with kidney failure and people at the end of life. I think these are immensely complex decisions and I think at one level there's no obvious right or wrong answer. Uh, save to engage a moral community of persons who understand the situation professionally, who are physicians and who are nurses, and who are patients, into some sense of how we apportion our resources. It, it, it's one level, it's the same question. I mean, how do you spend your time if you're a father or a mother and you have to earn money and spend time with your children and look after your aged relatives and help with community groups in the, in the, in, in the village? I mean, th these are all apportionment decisions that we take all the time, typically intuitively. And my response, I think, will be underlined by the comment that if we lose our broad sense of the fundamental dignity of all human life, we lose our capacity to make those intuitive decisions. And we get involved in utilitarian sort of calculus, ordering points, numbers, how we assess this versus that. The intuition of the moral community on the basis of our common vision of the dignity of every individual, I think, is central to our being able to make any kind of moral sense of those decisions. Let me follow that up with another related question for you, Dr. Cameron. Given your respect for all human life, what is your answer to the overly burdened family of the severely disabled individual? What is your answer for caring for individuals who have no caring family? Well, of course, an easy answer would be to say the state should provide more resources uh, or the community, Christians and, and others, should be more helpful uh, and such things. It seems to me, though, that the question you raise is that of whether we are able in this world um, to guarantee persons a certain degree of happiness and sustenance, and we are not. Because we live, uh, Christians believe in a fallen world, we all acknowledge in a world full of disorder, um, and we have no way of answering the tragedies of individual lives in a way that can guarantee that people can cope with them. I think, however, we as individuals and as communities plainly have extraordinary moral obligations to aid one another at times of crisis and tragedy. And that is an experience which, of course, the uh, September 11 events, I think, have brought home to many people, that we are one global community, we're certainly one national community, and we should be much more concerned with what we can do individually to help others, as well as with devising systems of support um, which are more able um, to help them sustain their lives. But we live in a world in which there are no such guarantees. Well, we've now come to the end of this part of our evening, even though there are so many more questions, and I regret those of you who didn't have your questions included. I'm just looking at some of these questions. They're rather ambitious, like what is the purpose of life? Um, but no time, uh, for, alas, for that. Uh, what we'll do instead is we'll have a six-minute concluding statement of remarks by each of the debaters, participants, and we'll hear first from Peter Singer since Nigel Cameron began. Thank you very much. Um, let me just, uh, since this is the last to hear from me, let me thank uh, uh, Nigel Cameron and Michael Krasny and the um, CBC for putting on this debate, which I think has been a, I hope you'll find, a, a useful and clarifying experience. 
Let me just say, to really sum up, I think Nigel Cameron's position tries to say, well, look, um, it's just a matter of being human, and that's really what counts with, with us. Um, and we don't want to get into anything like looking at the kinds of characteristics that beings have. That's, that's a bad way to go. But I think that that's really a very unsatisfactory answer unless you really are just appealing to some sort of religious doctrine. In other words, just to say, well, well, you know, we should just take that as a fact. Why is that morally significant, simply being human? I think you have to give, say something more about that. We want to say that it's worse to kill a human being than it is to kill uh, a, a cabbage, say, to take an extreme example of a being that's not even conscious. And I certainly say, as I said, I think it's worse to kill a human being than it is to kill a chicken or a fish, which are beings that can suffer pain, but I don't think have the kind of self-awareness that I was talking about. And I think you have to say why. And I don't think you can just say because they're human, because of their human nature, um, or, just, or because they're one of us. Those, those are question-begging answers. I think that really, you know, the reason that Dr. Cameron is defending this is, as he's made clear, because of his Christian beliefs, which, you know, tell him that every human has an immortal soul or something like that, or is made in the image of God, or that God granted us dominion over the animals but not over the humans, and this is really what lies behind it. And, you know, I mean, he's, he's obviously free to hold those beliefs, but I have to say, they're, they're not my beliefs, and I don't think they're beliefs that are persuasive to others who don't share that view and who are looking for some different kind of answer. Now, uh, what actually, the one reason why this is not such a simple answer anyway is that even if you say that, even if you say, well, we want to say they're one of us, part of our community, there's a whole lot of different questions that you have to answer about boundary lines. And I didn't find Dr. Cameron's answers very satisfactory in that way. Um, you have to answer questions about the boundary lines between uh, those of us with uh, capacities and those of us without them. I didn't find his answer on the anencephalic really satisfactory. But you have to also um, say, why is this difference between humans and non-humans Im so important? What about at the very beginning of life? Does he want to say that it's as wrong to destroy um, a, a single-celled embryo as it is to kill one of us? Um, that is, a being with a full awareness of, of their life and a desire to go on living. Um, and why should that be so? Because even at the very beginning of the creation of life, there's still boundaries to be drawn. What is the crucial moment supposed to be when you become one of us? Is it when the sperm penetrates the outside of the a layer of the egg or only when the genetic material of the egg and sperm fuse? Why would you choose those boundaries? What is supposed to make a difference in these sorts of cases. What about the fact that we have the capacity to, to create more lives by dividing the uh, embryos? Uh, should we do that? Or by creating new embryos, by taking a nucleus from our own bodies, perhaps, and implanting it into another one? Is, 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 does every cell in our body then somehow have the capacity for life, and is that also to become one of us? Uh, and then there are these boundaries and decisions about uh, between acts and omissions that I've been talking about. Why should you think that um, it's required by this idea of human dignity and uh, the, the wider human community, it's required at all costs to avoid intentionally ending a life by active means, but you're allowed to withdraw a respirator? We didn't really get onto this in detail, but certainly most people think that you are allowed to withdraw a respirator from someone, for example, who is, you know, ha suffering from terminal illness and, and will only live... Uh, uh, a few days or a week or two and uh, who doesn't feel that their life has anything that is worthwhile. Why should that not count as, as ending a life and is just as contrary to human dignity as actually giving uh, a lethal injection? Uh, what about the case of brain death? We haven't had a response from uh, Dr Cameron on whether he considers that people whose brains have irreversibly ceased to function but whose hearts are still beating and whose bodies are warm are one of us, are members of the human community or not. So there are all these difficult decisions, and the, the growth in medical technology just makes them more difficult. And that's why I think it's not enough to really just say, well, it's a matter of who is the wider human community. It's uh, something we need to think about a lot more. And let me just finish with one final point um, I was reminded of when Dr. Cameron referred to the wider global community right at the end. In fact, if we're concerned about human dignity and saving lives, 
It's very easy for us to save lives at very little cost if only we would really take seriously this idea that all human life is equally worth living or even my more limited version that the lives of all human beings who want to go on living is equally worth living. Because we know that there are um, close to 10,000 children dying every day from poverty related causes. And surely every time we go out to a restaurant, every time we spend money on new clothes or CDs or going to the theatre, we could be donating that money to help save these people's lives. But the very people who are strongly against the uh, idea of allowing, for example, voluntary euthanasia, are generally not to be heard in the forefront of those who are saying we must do a lot more, we must really get serious about addressing these issues and not give the, the token amount that the United States, for example, gives the lowest of all, of all the economically developed nations to foreign aid, um, which ought to be a matter of national shame that people who are concerned about the dignity of human life should be speaking against. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singer. We'll now hear concluding remarks from Dr. Cameron. Let me first uh, thank uh, Peter Singer for uh, his participation uh, in the, uh, this occasion. It has been a pleasure to be able to talk about these things in a civilized uh, forum. It's immensely difficult for us to do that when we have strongly held beliefs, and I want to say how much I appreciate the, those who participated and, and who have been quiet in our discussion, as well as those who have left after making their points, because I think we have to respect each of us, however we feel we can best participate in this difficult conversation. I want to make three or four quick comments and then a concluding remark. Um, since Peter Singer uh, launched this uh, international aid development salvo at the end, um, the, the, the gloves are taken off and I will refer, and of course he can't answer now, to the fact that when uh, some of you have heard in, 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 in uh, the, the, the radio show earlier this week with Michael Krasny, Peter Singer gladly acknowledged his principal support for bestiality sexual relationships of uh, humans and I thought very curiously plainly unconsenting animals or at least how one reads animal consent is an interesting question but having having um, having responded in kind um, one or two quick comments on this debate brain death issue I am the jury is out on brain death from my point of view I'm unconvinced by the uh, ready acceptance of some 20 years ago of criteria which essentially have determined that persons who uh, still have beating hearts and functioning organs are to be regarded as dead, particularly as the reason why we have done that is to secure supply of organs for transplantation. I'm uneasy about it. I'm unconvinced on either side. It seems to me it's a matter of a further study, and I accept this is an issue which is not easily resolved. Secondly, are we to say that because the Dutch legislature and the Belgians following them think that their euthanasia regime is a good idea, uh, that because the burghers of Amsterdam approve this, uh, all sane persons are going to approve it, when in the first draft of this legislation, children as young as 12 and 13 years old would have been allowed without parental consent to opt for euthanasia. What we see in Holland is the radical corruption of Western civilization, and it's very interesting. Many persons who favor euthanasia have gone visiting, like the British House of Lords Select Committee, loaded with pro-euthanasia people, came back from Holland and said, we don't want euthanasia in this country. Thirdly, animal suffering. I don't think uh, those who favor the animal liberation argumentation uh, need be left uh, to claim the moral uh, weight of this argument because historically there has been a major concern on the part of our culture for animal welfare. If we are inconsistent, if the suffering of individual animals, let us say in the food production chain, is a matter that has not been adequately addressed, let us address it. We can well address it within the framework of uh, the commitment we have to the uniqueness of human life. Fourthly, uh, the um, question of the killing of handicapped babies. Should the baby live? No. 
I find uh, Peter Singer's justification of this essentially in his buy-in to the um, pro-life argumentation in respect of the continuity of unborn and born human life, which does seem to me to be a statement of the utter obvious. Um, but the continuity of unborn and born human life to be profoundly disturbing. Because, of course, it is one thing to say that the same uh, legitimacy which, which is held in law to attach to a mother's right to choose to end the life of her fetus with serious handicap should be extended after birth. The logic of that position is that, therefore, the mother's right in law to end the life of her normal fetus for extraneous reasons should be extended after birth also. And what we have here, of course, is the rebirth of the Roman notion of the power of the father to kill his children, which is one of those many features of life in the ancient world that the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ and the triumph of the Judeo-Christian worldview got rid of. But to pull these things together, this is, of all the debates in which we can engage, this is the clearest debate between different views of the world. It's a worldview debate. There are inconsistencies, there are untidinesses on both sides of the uh, stage today. Uh, neither of us is coming uh, with a position which is easy to defend at all points, and which has clarified all of its internal contradictions, and I don't think either of us would claim that. Seems to me, however, and I pick up here my point about the utility of Peter Singer to this debate, which is a utilitarian, I think he should appreciate, utter utility of him to this debate is in values clarification. Because there is no better conversation into which we can get if we want to understand the significance of the big decisions facing the modern world in its handling of the significance of human life and human dignity. In the Judeo-Christian view of the world, we have God the Creator, we have a world made by Him, we have human beings made by him in his own image, which would be an utter blasphemy were it not there in Holy Scripture. Human beings of the kind, this is why these war graves in Rwanda and eastern Bosnia are so significant, because these bones being unearthed are of men and women made in the image of God. We have man, male and female, humankind set to rule the world, not as something for our own benefit, but as stewards of God to whom we must give account. And therefore, in our use of the wider environment and of the animal orders, as of our fellow human beings, accountability, moral responsibility is the key. But within that view of the world, there are, of course, many matters to be addressed. Issues of medical futility, issues of resourcing, issues of international development, how it is we spend money coming to this debate rather than sending it off to save the life of a child in Central Africa. Those issues remain to be addressed. The choice we have to make, the choice facing the Western world, is whether we go this way or that, whether we begin with an intuitive commitment on theological or other grounds to the unique dignity, the indivisible dignity of those who are members of Homo sapiens, the human species, or whether we do not. Thank you. Let me uh, extend thanks to both Peter Singer and Nigel Cameron for an excellent, spirited, illuminating debate. I don't know that we witnessed a debate of the century, but we certainly witnessed an extraordinary debate this evening by both. Also, thanks to the Center for Bioethics and Culture and the Life Legal Defense Fund for sponsoring this evening. And thanks very much to all of you. Good evening.